about a year ago, a, a professor at Wharton named Katie Milkman and I got together and asked each other, you know, what's the one thing we want to do before we die? Um, and, and we had the same answer, which is that we feel that in this century, the thing to crack is the code of human nature. So for us, we wanted to make a contribution to helping people live better lives through a better behavioral science. And so we have been working together intimately, daily, hourly on a project that we are calling Behavior Change for Good because of the double meaning, you know, behavior change that sticks, but also behavior change that's good for you and good for other people. Which, by the way, I will just say, I think that's what Aristotle meant by character, like stuff that's good for you and good for other people. Being a kind person, good for you, good for other people. Ditto for grit, self-control, gratitude, curiosity, and many, many other things. So let's start with the idea that these things that we do over and over again are what we call habits. And of course, there are bad habits, like you probably have them, right? Biting your nails, maybe some of you, or maybe some habits that are worse than biting your nails, but I won't go into them right now. Um, but at the same time, as Aristotle pointed out, as have many others, that virtue is a habit, that excellence is a habit, that actually we have good habits as well. And in my own research, what I have found is that when you ask the question, why are, for example, more self-controlled children and adults better off in life? Like, why are they more accomplished? Why are they happier? Why do they have better relationships? To a large extent, what happens is that self-controlled people develop good habits. And that essentially puts on autopilot a lot of things that we would all like to do, like exercise or eat a healthy snack versus a less healthy snack or study if you're a student or you know, give money away. Uh, things that you do routinely are much easier to do than things that you, each time you do them, you're thinking about it, it's entirely conscious. And so our project is built around the idea that we can reverse engineer the psychology of habit and therefore accelerate the development of good habits for anybody for whom that is appealing. I'll start with a quick video that Katie and I made. Full disclosure, the MacArthur Foundation was giving away a single $100 million prize for the first time in their history. So I had some acquaintance with the MacArthur Foundation, but I had no ins on this one. And they were giving it away to a single team. It could be anyone. It could be General Motors. It could have been University of Pennsylvania. They made an announcement that said, one team somewhere in the world will win $100 million to change one urgent social problem. And every university applied, including Penn. We were actually Penn's official entry. It was like Survivor. They had this like <laughs> competition among professors. Like first there were 50 of us, and then like 25, and then eventually uh, there was only one team standing it, and it was Katie and me. We didn't win, so that's the you know slightly. If if it had been an HBO production, maybe we could have edited out the loss and you know make it us win. Uh, but I will say this: Katie Milken and I are incredibly gritty. So it took us about five seconds. I remember the the day she called me. She was like, "So." We didn't win. <laughs> and I was like in a gym in a hotel somewhere. And there was silence, and I was silent. And we were like, crap. And then we just like picked our heads up, and then we started working. And uh, with the support of the university, the extraordinarily generous support of the University of Pennsylvania, um, we are proceeding to do the same project that we would have done for $100 million with slightly less than $100 million, <laughs> um, but the same enthusiasm and energy. So I'll start us off with a video, and then I'll walk us through a little bit. And then I'm going to open it up for conversation. What if we could make meaningful progress on every major social problem of the 21st century with a single solution? As a math teacher in the public schools, I saw too many children fall short of their potential. Both of my parents are cancer survivors. Watching them beat the disease made me want to help people make better decisions on a daily basis. There are so many urgent social problems. 40% of premature deaths are linked to habits that can be changed. One in three families has no savings at all. One in four students never earns their high school diploma. Getting people to consistently make better choices will reduce these problems and many more. If you repeatedly reward good behavior and pair it with memorable cues, 
positive routines become instinctual. We'll use technology to make good decisions easier. Turn daily burdens into things you look forward to. Teach skills and knowledge that are critical to success. Until now, no team has had the interdisciplinary expertise and the time horizon to say, we can solve this problem. We have united the world's experts on behavior change with innovative partners in health, education, and finance. If we can solve enduring behavior change, we can address every major social ill that confronts humanity. Thank you. We should have won. We absolutely should have won. Um, <laughs> We thought that video was just, you know, slam dunk, and uh, and and like I said, you know, we still believe that the the thesis is true. I mean, every single one of you, I don't even have to know you. You must struggle with some behavioral problem because you're human, and that is uh, really actually the the take home message of these graphs. One of our collaborators is Wendy Wood. Uh, Katie and I, I'll just footnote this for those of you who really think about Penn and their strategy uh, moving forward. I actually grew up near the University of Pennsylvania in the 1970s and 80s, and I have seen the university transform itself into truly a pioneer at the, at the leading edge. And Katie and I are banking on the following. We think Penn is going to continue to be truly a world-class leader, but it can't realistically have every great social scientist, because some of them have to be at Stanford, and some of them have to be at Harvard. <laughs> So we decided to try to make Penn into the epicenter of behavioral science. So we do have great scientists at Yale and other places, but they're all linked to Penn. And so when the banner flies over this project, it will be a University of Pennsylvania project, but we in, you know, involve in that project many, many other professors. So one of our professors is Wendy Wood. Uh, Wendy and Katie and I joked only half seriously at the very uh, beginning, I guess half kidding, half serious, at the beginning of the project that maybe it could be 100% all female team. Um, and for a while we were doing that. We have a female uh, executive director named Dina, Katie and I, and then eventually we had to hire a guy. But um, uh, we conceded some ground there. But one of our team members, Wendy Wood at USC, uh, has this graph or a set of graphs from one of her papers, and you'll notice that all these graphs, I'll, I'll walk you through them, they're all like triangle shaped. Um, and, and you'll start to understand the, the challenge of, of self-control and behavior change a little bit more when I start naming what these um, graphs are all about. On the top left, this is a, you know, a random assignment study of uh, weight loss. On the top right, it's gym visits. On the bottom left, it's quitting smoking. And on the bottom right, it's physical activity. And essentially, in all of these health behaviors, uh, if you intervene, you can get like a peak of a triangle. So in the solid line, that's an intervention. And at the peak of the triangle, the intervention is working. And everyone feels awesome. And people are going to the gym. And they are not smoking, et cetera. But what happens after the intervention ends, for example, if people pay you to go to the gym after the intervention ends, you are not going as often as when you were being paid. And ditto for other kinds of motivational supports. Um, it's not that you're, you're not benefiting at all, but you're not benefiting as much as when the intervention was active. And so the challenge for us is, how do you get people to truly have things on autopilot such that you don't really need to keep boosting the motivation in the same way? Now, my favorite children's story, for those of you who uh, know it, the frog and toad stories, classic. Um, and I um, actually, I think I cited this in an academic paper, which was fun, because like when you get to the back, and there's like proceedings of the National Academy of Science, and then there's frog and toad. Um, <laughs> but in this classic children's story, I think is crystallized really one of the primary dilemmas of the human condition, which is that we are often confronted by a situation where we want to do one thing, and we, quote unquote, really want to do something else. In other words, we have goal conflict. And so when you don't want to go to the gym, but you feel like you ought to go to the gym, or you kind of want to check your social media account, but you also have a to-do list, you know, these are just human 
uh, dilemmas that, uh, you know, even as early as four or five, you know, children will recognize as part of life. And it's Katie and our jobs to actually figure out how do you get people through these, but more importantly, eventually when you have a habit, you actually don't actually struggle as much. So how do you get it to be the habitual thing to do the ought or should thing and not succumbing to something that you'll regret? By the way, the title of the story is Cookies. And Frog and Toad bake a large batch of what appear to be chocolate chip cookies, although it's not specified. And they're eating them fin over fin. And Frog says to Toad, you know, we should really stop eating these cookies. And Toad says to Frog, absolutely, I'm getting sick, as he reaches for another one, which I'm sure we've all experienced uh, in our own lives of some sort or another. And then, uh, you know, one says to the other, like, you know what we really need is willpower. You know, what's willpower? Willpower is trying hard not to do something that you really want to do. Now, beginning of this project, we said, what's already known in 2017? And so for your reward for coming tonight on this beautiful evening in New York is that uh, on behalf of KDE and myself and the other team scientists, we will tell you some things that science already knows. It's incontrovertible. There are three things that clearly work for supporting healthy habits. And maybe to make this presentation a little more relevant and more likely to stick in your head, think for one moment about a personal behavior that you would want to do more or less. It could be exercising, it could be eating uh, differently, it could be checking your email less, it could be checking your email more, but that's probably not the case. Um, it could be sleeping better, sleeping more, going to bed earlier. Um, it could be, uh, you know, starting, uh, you know, a, a routine of, you know, preparing for, you know, some extra degree that you're hoping to work for. It really could be anything that you feel you might be in a frog and toad situation where on a daily basis, even though you really value the goal of healthy eating, et cetera, it's going to conflict with momentary pleasures that will be, at the time, maybe a little more alluring. Three things that will help you toward any personal goal that you're working toward are immediate rewards, and I don't just mean money, but anything that's pleasurable in the moment, uh, planning ahead, and then reminders. Because for most of us, we're not good at doing things that are not immediately rewarding, Right? That's why retirement savings is so hard. I mean, everybody lectures you about your retirement savings, but frankly, if you just go to Starbucks and buy a Frappuccino, it tastes better than your retirement savings. <laughs> right? So you have to figure out how to make healthy behavior immediately rewarding in some way. Uh, everybody knows that they should do things, but very few people specifically plan what exactly they're going to do. So for example, maybe you said, yeah, yeah, I really have to get around to you know, eating healthier in 2017. Uh, but unless you make a, a specific plan about like what exactly the change is going to be and when it's going to happen, it's actually very unlikely that anything is going to change. So planning ahead in advance and imagining the future with some specificity absolutely 100% works. And finally, reminders, because a lot of human behavior and human behavior change is just remembering to do the thing that you want to do. And so we forget. So we uh, sometimes lapse, not because we're struggling in the moment, but just because it's just not top of mind. So these three things are going to be built into everything that we do. Katie and I don't find this especially interesting because it's already known and we're scientists, and everything that we're building is on top of this. So how can we do even better than just reminding people, just getting them to plan ahead, and just providing some kind of reward in the moment? Let me, uh, just as an illustration, tell you about a study that Katie herself did at a large gym at a Fortune 500 company, which shall remain nameless. Uh, what Katie did was recruited people, employees of this workplace, and randomly assign them to two different conditions. In the red, I have the gym visits of the treatment condition, and in the gray, the, the gym visits of the control condition. And what happened in this four-week intervention is that there were reminders, uh, there was a plan, and also uh, there were these uh, rewards. They were actually financial rewards. They got paid a few dollars uh, every time they went to the corporate gym, which was on site. And what you find is that when you pay people and remind them and they make a plan, miraculously, they actually do the desired behavior, their own desired behavior to go to the gym more. 
What happened then for the next year or so, really 44 weeks, is that the gym visits went down because they're no longer being actively rewarded. They're no longer you know, actively making plans. Um, I think they were still uh, reminded periodically um, is that you know, there's this decrease. Um, and you can see that there is still, the red line is above the gray line for much of that period. This suggests to us that it's a start, but we can certainly do better than just these three little nudges. So the take home from this is that, yeah, it's a good thing to reward people, to have them plan ahead, and to remind them they want to make a gym habit. But certainly, we can do better than this. By the way, if you want to know what these uh, sharp downturns are, uh, and this may be familiar to any of you who have tried to get an exercise habit going, when there's a disruption in your routine, like, I'm doing really well, and then there's like the winter holiday, uh, it's, that's when actually people like, don't come back to their routine. So um, the next time this is like in your life, you're like, you should just know that is a period of vulnerability, and then you should make extra uh, intentional plans to actually get back to your routine after you come back from vacation um, and other kinds of transitions. So here's what we're doing. We're going to try to create a digital platform. I should actually use the present tense because um, we, being two women, we already did it, right? So we were like not going to like just talk about it or delegate it. We like built it. Um, and so what we're trying to do with this platform is to take all the millions of people in the world who are trying to change behavior of one kind or another, trying to save more, trying to exercise more. For me, being a former teacher, I really had the education projects. So students trying to study more and procrastinate less. We're trying to actually you know, work through organizations to find these millions of people. So our partners are big. They include things like the KIPP charter schools, the New York City public schools, the college board, which administers the SAT and the AP, also health partners like 24 Hour Fitness, uh, one of the largest gym chains in the United States, and financial partners like Bank of America. And then we take these scientists, and we uh, have recruited them uh, largely at Penn, uh, across all of the schools at Penn, but also, as I mentioned, at other universities um, that, uh, that are really, you know, in our view, uh, terrific. Uh, they also have credentials like uh, four MacArthur winners. We have Nobel Prize winners, the chair of economics at Harvard, um, and other folks who are just like, they're, they're the best. Um, and, and Katie and I um, said to these amazing scientists who are in large part our current collaborators or friends, you know, we will build a platform that will allow you to reach millions of people through large organizations. And really what this platform does, it's an online way to actually talk to and interact with these people digitally. So we think of this as essentially a way of bringing uh, science uh, to millions of people in a frictionless and uh, fast way. I'll give you a little more detail about that. This is, um, uh, these are the mock-ups of our, our first screenshots. If you enroll in one of our um, in our programs, and this would be, for example, if you're a 24-hour fitness member and you get an email from your gym that says, we are partnering with the University of Pennsylvania uh, at the Behavior Change for Good project, and for free, you can get motivational support for 28 days to see if you can make a healthy habit. Uh, you would then start to see uh, you know, screenshots like this uh, on your phone um, that would walk you through, for example, making plans um, and also a, a scheme for giving you some points, uh, which are immediately rewarding. So uh, your cardiologist might tell you, you know, you really have to lower your blood pressure. But frankly, going on the Stairmaster is like not that fun and not that rewarding. But so, you know, we're trying to make it fun, you know, give points and some small cash prizes, gift cards. Um, and then, as I mentioned, these reminders, right? So you will be texted and reminded. Now, some of us are lucky enough to have a significant other in our life or a best friend who will text us and remind us to do the things that we said we would do. In this case, it will be University of Pennsylvania uh, that is texting and reminding people, like, you said you want to go to the gym at 4 o'clock. It is now 3.15. It's in 45 minutes. You know, this is your reminder to go. So through this platform, uh, we, we give everybody essentially the three things that we know will work. And then the scientists build on top of that, and they add different activities that they think are going to uh, provide an additional boost of motivation. So a, a, a 
about uh, half of our team really, maybe two thirds, were able to join us at a meeting uh, in May at the University of Pennsylvania in one of the lovely new buildings at the medical school like super lovely new buildings at the medical school. Um, and we were able to talk for two days straight on uh, what we really think at circa 2017 the very best ideas are for getting into the psychology of motivation, um, the psychology of sticking with things, and the, of ultimately the neuroscience of, of, of doing something on automatic where you just don't even think about it. Um, and so this is a, you know, a snapshot of our esteemed group. What it doesn't show is uh, Danny Kahneman, who came the next day and told us, um, keep doing what you're doing. Danny Kahneman, of course, the Nobel Prize winner who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow. And um, uh, he recently met with Katie and me. And he said, keep doing what you're doing, because this is actually one of the most important things that anybody could work on. So just to give you an idea of things that we might talk about in the in the free-for-all discussion where you uh, text in these questions and uh, Jean-Marie and I get to uh, try to talk through them. Here is a subsample, really, of some of the uh, ideas that are um, going to be tested on this digital platform, courtesy of our great scientists. And I'll just give you maybe one example um, to, uh, to get us like a flavor of this. So uh, temptation bundling is a, is a behavioral technique that Katie Milkman uh, discovered when she was a junior faculty member at Penn. And of course, now she's tenured. What she um, came away from a particular vacation when she was, you know, off and uh, relaxing a little bit was that, you know, when she was able to do something fun at the same time as something that she had to do, she was just much more likely to do it. So for example, if you worked out while watching Game of Thrones <laughs> and only allowed yourself to watch Game of Thrones when you were working out, then you would be temptation bundling, bundling a temptation with a healthy behavior that's maybe not as fun as Game of Thrones. And it only works, by the way, if you use a little bit of discipline to say, like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to let myself uh, have this indulgence except for then. And you can imagine this going in lots of different directions. And I use it, too. It's like I you know, don't love to ride an exercise bike, but I am more willing to do it if I also get to watch a favorite, quote, unquote, guilty pleasure uh, um, show. So in a temptation bundling activity, after you know, being taught how to make a plan, and you know, setting up my text reminders and being told that I would get some points every time I went to the gym, I would be told like how to do temptation bundling and some suggestions. And then my text messages would also remind me of that particular strategy for 28 days, uh, after which we hope there was you know, be a chance that that would become a habitual thing. And that well, basically every time you go to the gym, you know that you, know, you have your favorite music or your favorite show, something that would make self-control easier. So there are many other ideas, actually, even than this. Um, but it gives you a sense of the, the, the way that we're thinking about this, that, that as hardworking as you know, Katie Milkman and Angela Duckworth are, we, we can't have all the great ideas. Just like I think as wonderful a university as Penn can be, they can't have all of the Nobel Prize winning scientists. So we are trying to create an epicenter. We're trying to create a network so that we can kind of wrap our arms around a lot of this um, great thinking, but not try to do it with any single person, in fact, uh, by making this whole project into an epicenter. Uh, it's uh, been a wonderful thing to attract some amount of attention for this work. So Freakonomics, a podcast that my suspicion is that some of you listen to, Stephen Dubner's uh, podcast, uh, decided to do their first ever series on a single project ever in the history of the podcast um, on this project. So we've uh, done two episodes, and uh, we are um, you know, working with them to create the third one. And I think the reason why it's attractive is that because we are uh, on to something in terms of a problem, right? So I think people have realized that the 20th century has been pretty awesome at uh, increasing manufacturing efficiency and linking the whole world together informationally so that you can Google almost anything. But I think it's still an unsolved problem how we confront our own human nature and how we live lives that are uh, happy and successful when we are sometimes uh, deeply conflicted within ourselves. And finally, let me um, end with this uh, quote from Peter Drucker, the management guru, who wrote, in a few hundred years, it's likely that the most important event historians will see is not technology, not the internet, not e-commerce. It is an unprecedented change in the human condition 
for the first time, they will have to manage themselves. And society is totally unprepared for it. Our interpretation of this quote is that the, the final frontier of, uh, of human innovation will be to understand our own human nature and, and to master it and to be able to live lives where we are not conflicted and we are doing things uh, that we feel good about as opposed to regretful. So with that, let me thank you for your attention. Uh, and thank you for coming tonight. And I look forward to questions. Thank you.